he'll be back. Um, so this is the uh, facilities meeting of November 29th. Uh, present are board, uh, board members, committee members, Eva Alcraft Kerr, Artie Kissimus, and myself, Mike Barbas' chair. Our superintendent, Stephen Adamowski, is here. Uh, common council member, I want to call you Bruce. Uh, Bruce Kimmel is here, as well as our CFO, um, Tom Hamilton, and our, our head of facilities, Bill Hodell, as well for our fellow CZ and Brenda uh, Williams. And uh, our speaker, uh, who will, I believe, uh, start with this, is Mike Zuba from uh, Malone and McBroom. Mr. Mr. Chairman, in terms of the agenda tonight, there were really uh, kind of two things that were follow-ups from the, the, the last facilities committee meeting. Uh, one was this issue of the walk zone yes. uh, around uh, the proposed building sites in South Norwalk, and the other was for complete information on the survey, um, uh, the, the South Norwalk survey, which we now have. So we've grouped those under, under old business. <clears throat> but I just wanted to point out our primary purpose tonight uh, is the Ponus Ridge project. And then yep. uh, per year, um, you know, instructions are going to be returning to the South Norwalk school site at the next at the subsequent meeting. At the subsequent exactly. meeting. So with, those are the two things we need to follow up on. And we have Mike Zumba, who's done some excellent work uh, defining uh, uh, the, the, the walk zone and the racial balance issues. And they bring us to several conclusions, uh, which I think we, we do want to uh, be able to discuss with you tonight. Thank you, Dr. Adamowski. So I'll jump right in. Jump right into it. So um, as, as the follow-up from the last meeting, um, you know, we were really asked to take a look at that critical quarter mile, which really started at a at a half mile. And we found that a half mile just encompassed way too many kids for the size of the school um, that we were discussing in South Norwalk. So we cut that back to a quarter mile and uh, and began looking at Columbus, beginning looking at the Ely site, just to see how many students would fall in that catchment if you were to have a quarter mile radii around it. And it's a fairly dense neighborhood area. Um, for the Nathaniel Ellie neighborhood, um, we're capturing about 412 pre-K-8 students, and that's based on the addresses of the current 16 and 17 um, student enrollment. Um, around the Columbus neighborhood, um, we're capturing about 540 students. Um, what you'll see on all the maps is sort of the underlying color, and especially in the South Norwalk area, you're gonna see uh, many different patterns of color. So that just shows how fragmented the existing catchment zones are there, as well as having this gray area, um, which refers to those unassigned areas within the neighborhood. Taking a deeper dive into the, turn the projector. Yeah, you got me. Yeah, it wasn't me. Yeah. No, it's and that's Tom. Tom. Thank God, Tom. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, look, looking at the two areas and taking a, deep, a deeper dive, you know, as was asked by us, to be able to take a look at what is the composition of the students there, because we know um, overall the district is about 69 percent. We have a target of about 86 percent to be able to be within the compliant zone of that state mandate. Um, looking at the Ely area, we have about 95% non-white, 84% of those are free and reduced lunch at the pre-K-8 level. That doesn't really change when you take a look at some of the younger students and we now have those 6th through 8th graders, it's still um, 95 and now 83%. In the Columbus area, of, of the 539 students, we have 97% are non-white and 87% are eligible for free and reduced lunch and that reduces slightly when you look at um, just the uh, pre-K-5 component there of 96% and 84%. Um, so just using that quarter mile as our only parameters for the catchment zone, especially for looking at the uh, looking at the Ely area, we have about the right number of students. However, uh, we would not be anywhere close to being in compliance if it was strictly a neighborhood school um, drawing there for the uh, for the attendance zone in the catchment area. Um, Diving down even deeper within that uh, within that quarter mile, looking at where the students currently attend. As I had mentioned earlier, we had the very colorful map with all those different areas assigned as attendance zones. So um, students are being outplaced not only from the magnet programming, um, but also just the nature of the sending and receiving areas um, for the uh, for the Sono district or Sono area um, of the uh, of the students we have there. Just really focusing on the upper table, those elementary school students. Um, we really have uh, a collection of schools that those students 
um, attend with the Row 8 in elementary leading the way at about 55 students or about 19%. Um, Silver Mine is about 40 students or about 13%. Oh, I skipped Kendall, Kendall S72 about 25%. Um, and Columbus Magnet, um, 22 per, or 22 students or 8%. So really there is a potpourri of students attending various uh, elementary schools throughout the throughout the city. When we look at the middle school attendance, it's a little more evenly split um, between the uh, between the schools themselves. With the, of the 122 divided by four, it's roughly about 30 per each of those uh, each of those schools within that quarter mile attending zone. God bless you. Thank you. Um, taking a look at the quarter mile around the uh, around the Columbus school, um, what we find by uh, by looking at where the students actually attend there, um, Brookside Elementary has the largest percentage of students attending at 20% or 74 students, um, and then we have a clustering of Columbus, Cranberry, as well as as well as Aramac Elementary School there, and each in the mid 30s, and then Silver Mine 47 and Wolf Pit. 68. So we have some predominant outplacements, but there's still um, many students attending some smaller components of schools. Um, looking at the uh, middle school there, it's a little less evenly distributed with West Rocks and Nathan Hill um, being the predominant middle schools that those students attend. And then Ponis and, and Roten there, um, with Roten the next largest attendant and Ponis the least. As and I know this doesn't directly follow your agenda, but just for um, sake of continuity, if you don't mind, I'll kind of keep going, Dr. Dr. Adamowski. Um, so what we wanted to do was really take a look at drawing um, a, a capture zone or a tenant zone around the uh, Vanderbilt Italy site, as well as then what would be the balancing factor that would be necessary from a magnet component in order to be able to have compliance with the uh, state racial balance mandate. And we have two different options here. And you know these options aren't set in stone. This is really kind of the starting point, giving you food for thought, getting that discussion flowing around good information. Um, option one is really looking at a more limited neighborhood component. We have a very small capture zone, much smaller than that quarter mile that we showed. There's about 290 students within this. We just carve this up for discussion purposes. There could be adjustments made to it based on input. Um, those students coming from Rudner Court as well as the stable residential neighborhoods um, that are just to the south and just to the north of the site. Um, what we're doing, because we know this area is predominantly non-minority students, we're looking at having a draw of about 185 from throughout the district. So this would be what we would call a, an open magnet or an open choice system um, where there would be no ranking and weighting based on um, any factors or neighborhoods of where those sending areas are. It's just assuming that the students of this 185 really represent that 69% minority of the rest of the district. Um, in order to achieve that target threshold of 86% for the racial balance, we would need about 185 students of those 290 students um, coming from outside. So coming from outside the neighborhood. So it gives you a much smaller neighborhood component, but it gives you a much larger um, opportunity for the choice program for that neighborhood school or for that for that school. Um, looking at the other option, option two, we wanted to uh, um, bring in a much larger neighborhood component and have a, a much more concise or precise um, magnet component that would be based on geographic area um, that would be really kind of um, aiming to balance the racial, racially balance the school. So looking at a larger neighborhood component, we're filling it out of about 400 students um, for a pre-K five <coughs> based on the boundaries that we captured here. A lot of this is picked up not only in the um, neighborhood surrounding the site, but also working <coughs> on northward and capturing a lot of those unassigned students as well. Um, we assume 65 students would be attending from uh, from a magnet system that would draw based on a geographical area, um, and that 80% of those magnet students would be non-minority, so um, almost the opposite of what we're talking about for the neighborhood. Um, so that allows you to have a much larger neighborhood component, um, being able to get more of those students that are um, within the area there into the, the new elementary school, but also then limiting the uh, limiting that choice component or the magnet component for it in order to attain that 85, 86% threshold that we know is the target for racial balance according to the uh, state mandate. Do you have a question? No. 
It's not like you have a question. If, if you have a question, honestly, on the slide, just stop me and then and, and, and we can discuss. The what, one I point just, what I think might be helpful is in either of these cases, especially the second case, have, have you had examples you've worked with in, that are kind of structured similarly? To this one? Yeah. Yeah, we've, there, there's many ways to achieve it. Mm -hmm. um, what we've seen before and what we've worked on, um, where sometimes you have a combination of not only the neighborhood component and the magnet that is targeted to, say, certain neighborhoods, because you know the underlying demographic there. Another one would be to have the neighborhood component as well as the satellite area. Um, in addition to the choice, so you could have then two structured geographic areas um, that are completely different demographics feeding into the school and then you have this overarching open choice sort of magnet component around it. Mm -hmm. um, what we find from experience is really what works best for your individual community and that's from um, the parental and the community viewpoint of you know what do they view the schools as? Are they neighborhood schools or are they choice schools and what is acceptable? Um, what are your transportation challenges? How is your roadway network set up? How best can you move students based on these areas where your existing sort of um, portfolio of buildings are? Do you have an area that has been growing that maybe isn't best served by a, a school in that area where you can satellite them into a school? So it really it gives you an opportunity to be able to develop a solution that is tailored to you guys and what you want to accomplish. But I've seen many different options as well as full open choice. So. Uh, we were asked next to... Before you go to Jefferson, Jefferson is really under 4C of yes. the agenda. Yeah, yeah I appreciate um, that. I, I just wanted to make a kind of a clarifying conclusion from um, what Mike just presented to you. Uh, when we began this discussion, it was unclear as to whether or not the second school in South Norwalk could be a, simply a neighborhood school or needed to be a um, district, an intra-district uh, magnet program. It's now clear from the, uh, from the uh, uh, demographic analysis that we would need both schools to be intra-district magnets in order to reach the racial balance guidelines. So I think that's a major constructural, structural component we need to put in place to these uh, recommendations now. And at your, um, <clears throat> at your next meeting, I'm going to be uh, discussing some program options with you that are derived from our survey, but also uh, what we feel would be robust enough to be able to attract uh, a significant number of, of uh, families <coughs> from outside the neighborhood uh, to these schools in order to achieve uh, racial balance. So again, this is a, a major learning, I think, I think a major conclusion that was uh, unknown, you know, even a few, a few weeks ago, um, that both schools will need to be intra-district uh, <coughs> themed uh, program schools. Um, and uh, there are kind of a set of questions, and I'm sure maybe my committee members have them too, but Mike, looking at these data of where students in these two quarter mile zones, radiuses, live, or radii live in, you know, it seems like they're more spread out to a certain extent in the Columbus quarter mile radius than the Ely. Mm -hmm. um, is that because, and maybe you don't know this number, but is this because there are a lot of unassigned, what they sometimes call District 99 students, or is it just the way uh, that patch quilt of neighborhood schools is, is uh, developed or has been, has been established? It's actually a little bit of both. You do have some of these smaller, sort of, I'll call them satellites, the neighborhood school areas in there. Okay. Um, so that contributes to some degree, but it's also the unassigned and, you know, the choice of, of, of where they're placed, um, you know, it's difficult for us to, as an, as an outside consultant to say, well, is it based on capacity? Is it based on space? Probably it is. That's the logical answer. And it also could be part of the overall racial balancing plan for each of those more suburban type of the neighborhood schools that would be balancing sort of from the other side as well. I mean, just having been on the board five years, my take is until a couple of years ago, it was more kind of space available, okay. random than anything else. I think under the new superintendent, we have a different strategy towards mm -hmm. the, the, the District 99 students. 
and, and parents are given a choice. I don't yeah. know how much that's been used in practice, but mm -hmm. um, so I think it is. And I know, you know, at one point, like you could see in the Columbus uh, radii, you know, all those students at Wolf Pit, there was a period there where the Wolf Pit neighborhood, their enrollment really dropped. And that was really our only school that had capacity. Yep. And so I, I don't think we've, in my knowledge, in the five years I've been on the board, we've never said, oh, this, or no one in central office, in my knowledge, has said, oh, this school is uh, off, off, you know, racial balance regs. It's really been more space available. Catch as catch can has yeah. been my take. I mean, they used to do it in August, you know, a week before, two weeks before school started. It was crazy. Um, and then my second question is, you know, as the demographer having looked at this data, it seems pretty clear cut that if you were going to choose where you would build a new school, you might be more partial to the Columbus area because there are more kids in that quarter mile radius than there are in the Ely catchment area within a quarter mile. I mean, at the margin, right? If I mean, you're yeah. looking P, uh, PK five two ninety versus three seventy five. I mean, that's almost twenty five percent more kids. If you were to have a solely walking school and you weren't at subject to the uh, state racial balance laws because you wouldn't right. be able to fill out the school, so you would automatically be... Right, not all of those kids would be able you, to you, Yeah, you would be out of compliance. Right, okay. Just uh, on that point, we can, also, um, we can also do what Stanford does and give preference to... Uh, students of families in income restricted housing. This is how Stanford um, uh, uh, deals with um, uh, the racial balance issue. And so you have the King Kennedy complex across from Columbus, you have the Rudner Court um, complex adjacent to Ely. Um, we could really accomplish the same thing either through giving neighborhood preference to a portion of the students, essentially we would have two different lotteries, right? One for neighborhood, one for the rest of the city. Or uh, we could give preference to students in income restricted uh, housing and probably accomplish the same thing. Uh, but again, the, the, the major learning here is that we will need to have a theme as an intra-district magnet in both uh, schools. And, um, you know, I think it's a decision of this committee as to whether or not you feel it is best to have the new school on the Columbus site or the Ely site, and vice versa. Wherever you make that decision, then Columbus would go on, on the other site. And I, I think that's something, you know, I hope you'll be discussing and um, uh, because that, that needs to be part of your recommendations to the, to the full board. But I think, Stephen, that you're, at this point, you have stated you know that obviously the the columbus magnet school wherever it's located would be a k-8 school correct and have you given us a recommendation on this new neighborhood or well new quasi neighborhood uh, i'll have several school. things to explore at your next meeting uh again some of this is derived from the survey some of it will be simply our judgment in terms of of how robust a uh, a choice uh, choice has to be in order to attract uh, families from other parts of the city. Um, but you've got, I think the way you've talked about is that the second school, at least here to four, would be maybe more of a PK-5 school. Correct. And they would go to middle school at Rome. No, the second school would definitely be a PK-5 school. Okay. And I think we're, uh, we, would, we would need to be consistent in the recommendation that those students go to Roten. So there would be about three, three sections about 70 students that would go to Roten, that, um, um, that, is, uh, that can be accommodated easily at Roten. And when we get further into the presentation at Jefferson, you'll see it's also uh, an offset for three sections less at, at Jefferson, as Jefferson becomes uh, part of the K-8 STEM school. Okay. That's great. And do you have any other questions? Right. Okay. Then let's move on to the kind of skipping on the agenda, going to four, four C, which is talking about Ponis and Jefferson. Unless you want Brenda to come up with the uh, mm -hmm. survey next, if you don't mind waiting, my just no, keep on South Norwalk. Brenda, would you yeah. like to come present? <coughs> Ralph, well, is it possible to skip ahead? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I threw the whole system off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. 
thought it was Tom. <laughs> 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 I mean, recall at your last meeting you had a preliminary look at this, but it did not include uh, the families attending the IC uh, preschool because those results had not been uh, uh, submitted and compiled yet. So this is the complete uh, everything now and right. complete analysis. We just some kind of choice. Would you rather have this versus that? Or it's like asking a kid, do you, would you like a piece of candy if you don't do it properly? Well, it was asked about South Norwalk in general. So we asked them, you know, if you were, if you had a choice, would you have a K through five, K through eight, or neither? Are you in favor of a school in South Norwalk or are you not? So the questions did build, but you didn't have to answer all of them. Does that answer your question? They were all separate. They were all separate. They were separate. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. And this was not a scientific survey necessarily. It's just a piece of input from the community and another piece of feedback. That and the questions support. are on the top of each slide, correct? Correct. The questions are on the top of each slide, yes. Yeah. So um, it wasn't for it's like you, if you answered yes, then you had a sub question. Each correct. question stood on its own. Correct. And you can see the surveys online. Yeah. yeah. Um, we asked um, the, the respondents if they were if a new school was to be built at Ely, would it be would they be interested in a K through five or a K through eight school? Um, we had about 402 people say K through eight out of the total. 247 K, K through five. About the South Norwalk. Think you, you see this consistently as an area of support for K eight schools yep. in, the, in the district. South Norwalk residents, um, 111 of them were in favor of K through five. 130 were in favor of the K through eight. Our unassigned families, um, 54 of them were in favor of K through eight. 52 were in favor of the K through five. And then we asked folks, or which are future families, our, our pre-K folks. K through five were 32, and, and K through eight was 48, about 57% to 38%. Sure. Uh, you say South Norwalk residents, are they in favor of the K through five or the K through eight? Uh, 
um, when you mentioned South Norwalk residents, did you ask them if they were South Norwalk residents, or yes, did you? Yep. Okay. Did you yep. put a parameter of what a South Norwalk resident is? We did not. Okay. We put a parameter for are you an unassigned resident, um, as the district is, defines unassigned, what the addresses are. Okay. But we did not. We let people self-identify if they were. From okay. So. Yep. And the other areas, you don't know where where they're from. Um, we have the other areas. We have it broken down by school. Okay. Um, we did ask people to identify if they were a affiliate current, of another school. Exactly. So we do have that breakdown. We just didn't break it down into that minutia here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we asked all respondents if uh, they thought that uh, the Nathaniel Ely location should be a neighborhood school or a magnet school. Um, pretty evenly divided, 55% versus 45% for neighborhood versus magnet. Just if they were going to magnet here. Uh, South, South Norwalk residents, 143 were in favor of a magnet school and 123 uh, voted for a neighborhood school. And then the breakdown for the unassigned families, 49% uh, to 51% neighborhood school, 61 magnet school, 58. So. Uh, and then we asked about the type of magnet theme or programming that folks thought a magnet school should have. And this is what uh, Dr. Adams talked about a little bit here. So we had a few different options that we asked people to choose from based on some of the feedback that we already had from the forums that we had and from the, the facilities committee meetings that we've had in the past, the, the budget forums. And those were, the options were moving the Columbus School with the Bank Street programming to the location. Um, another choice was adopting the environmental science program that Odyssey Preschool currently has in place and continuing that on um, into the new school. Another option was a STEAM program um, another option was a Montessori program, and then we had um, <coughs> just a, an answer for um, any other option. A couple of people did weigh in on things like IB, support for the arts, bilingual programs, but those were just one or two answers here and there for folks to get answer. Um, so as you can see here, there's a lot of support for um, a STEAM program among all the respondents, um, and some equal support for environmental science, and um, moving the Columbus program over. Changes a little bit when you get down to the South Norwalk residents and the um, unassigned locations. So you've got about 84 people who are in favor of environmental science and 81 who were in favor of STEAM. Um, so those are a little bit different than the overall numbers. And then when you talk about the families who live in unassigned locations, again, 42%, 42 people were in favor of an environmental science theme. 34 people were in favor of a STEAM program. Again, there was a lot of comments about um, making sure that the arts are involved and, and that we're keeping those in mind as well. I have, I have a quick question. Sure. Was there a qualifier in the question for environmental science that will be associated with the Maritime Center? Um, the qualifier was that it would be a, so it, it, that it would be like the Odyssey Learning Program. So okay. we did not qualify it as in, as a maritime affiliated program, but as an Odyssey Learning Center type okay. program. So. Hmm. Okay. And then our future families as well, um, similar to the South Norwalk families, the unassigned families as well, the environmental science and the STEAM programs were the two options that were most favored. So. Okay. We did separate out the feedback from Columbus families as they were involved in a lot of the discussions that we had in South Norwalk at the meeting that we had down at Nathaniel Ely as well as meetings that we had there on site. Um, there were 74 total responses um, from people who identified as Columbus families. Um, and as you can see here, um, they are very much in favor of a K through 8 program. As Dr. Adamowski mentioned, you know, that's already something that's in the works for Columbus. Um, the themes that they were interested in for potential new school, if um, there was one that could be, I think, Daniel Ely. Um, I was surprised to find that 35 of them 
um, did talk about moving Columbus over to Nathaniel Ely as something that would be um, of interest. Um, and STEAM and environmental science were other ones that this group was um, behind as well. So some, some of the open answers we got, they were a little bit all over the place. It was an interesting opportunity for people to have a lot of input on a lot of a variety of topics, but there were some themes that came out of this. Um, far and away, the number one piece of input that people gave in the open answers is that they're concerned about the other schools in the system as well. They understand the need for extra space. Um, and the, the interest of, of South Norwalk and, and the building there. But people also want to make sure that our other school buildings are not overlooked in the process um, because there's a keen awareness that we need investment and upgrades throughout the system. Um, strong support for South Norwalk students deserving options closer to home. Um, it's very important to this community that the school reflect the diversity of Norwalk is something we hear um, very frequently. Making sure that it's a safe environment is an important part of the plan for folks. Um, as Dr. Adamowski talked about a little bit too, strong programming and support, including after school options. So people want to make sure that it's a comprehensive program with perhaps before and after care, like after the bell, if we have in other schools. Uh, there's a lot of interest in more magnet programs overall in the district, but people want to make sure that the magnet schools are not taking away from the funding of our neighborhood schools at the same time. So there's a little bit of concern about that. And then um, last but certainly not least, um, there's some ongoing concern from our pre-K parents about making sure that there's continued availability of adequate, adequate spaces for younger kids, whether it's pre-K or daycare. Um, there's a lot of people who want to make sure that anything that we do at Nathaniel Ely or elsewhere keeps in mind that we need a lot of spaces for <coughs> pre-K students as well. So. Okay, so that's, um, that's pretty much it. I mean, overall, there was very strong support for a student in South Carolina. Artie, do you have something? You can finish up. Okay. Very strong support for a school at Nathaniel Ely. Um, sort of mixed information on what that theme might be. Um, and um, you know, a lot of support for making sure that we continue to focus on uh, the investment that's required at all our schools over the, the next five to ten year period. So. Uh, so the question is, with the theme of the magnet school, or if it's going to be a STEAM or environmental science, yeah. does this mean we would have to partner with the Maritime Center, or we would? Yeah, so, you know, uh, many of the parents, um, particularly those that um, were the future, in that future category, are parents that are enrolled at the uh, Odyssey Preschool. Uh, remember, Odyssey is the entity that took over for the housing authority. Uh, on all the city's preschool slots, and they're located primarily in that current uh, Nathaniel Ely building. So I have visited there, um, talked uh, with the director as well as Brian Davis, the, the head of the aquarium. They have a very good um, environmental science program at the school as one of the partners of, of Odyssey. Um, the, uh, the parents obviously like it, and I think you see their familiarity with it and liking it as reflected in their uh, survey responses. Uh, whether or not that would be robust enough to attract families from other parts of the city, I think is a judgment call that we're going to have to make, you're going to have to make. Um, but um, I've had one discussion with Dr. Davis. There is certainly openness on the part uh, of the Maritime <coughs> to partner with us. Um, this is a not without expense uh, because they would they similar to what they're yeah. doing at Odyssey they would have to station one of their educators actually at the school in order to do the environmental science uh, units there would be animal displays um, uh, at, at the school there would be field trips to um, the aquarium and back and forth and, and, and so on but um, this is a partner that has a, a very uh, well-developed um, 
uh, sense uh, of what an environmental science program should look like and also has spent time becoming knowledgeable in the next generation science standards uh, as, as the, uh, the, 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 the fundamental uh, delivery system uh, for this. So, you, you know, I, I would approach this with optimism that if we decided to go in this direction, and by the way, this is not a decision that you would make relative to the bricks and mortar recommendation to the board, but it would be something that would be looked at during the ed specs uh, process. <coughs> uh, in, in the spring, uh, but um, uh, certainly, you know, uh, consistent with our strategic operating plan, a partnership would be an important aspect here. Thanks. That would open up a whole bunch of other questions for me, too, in terms of, you know, what type of teachers are we going to hire, um, curriculum, things like that. Does it fall, still fall under our purview? You know, where does it, it lie? No, so it's, it's, it's a partnership. Yeah. Uh, it would not affect, um, it, would, it, would, it would certainly affect the science curriculum. Yeah. Uh, it probably would not affect uh, the ELA uh, or math curriculum. Um, the, um, you know, we're, we're, we are dealing with the handicap of having the um, shortest elementary school day. Uh, we would probably, in a partnership situation, have to extend the day in, in terms of the after-school programs being oriented toward the theme of the school, whether it was environmental science or, or, or something else. Uh, but these partnership schools are very common in other school districts in Connecticut throughout the, the, nature, the nation. I think uh, you know, we could certainly work it out and we would have a very solid partner uh, in the Maritime Aquarium if um, we decided to go in that direction. Stephen, don't we have some form of partnership with the Maritime as it is at Jefferson? Uh, we do it Jefferson for field trips, yes. Oh, not in the classroom. Correct. So there's not an educator there. There are aspects that are occurring at Odyssey that are not occurring in Jefferson. So just curious, you may not be able to answer this, but how long of a contract will we sign with them? Would this be an indefinite open-ended contract? I don't know. No. Yeah, you, you generally, yeah. generally, you would have a memorandum of understanding. Yeah. Right, and um, I mean the ones I've seen have been for three to five years, renewable by the, you know, mutual consent of the yeah. parties and so on. I'm sure they won't go belly up, but if they do, no, you you, you need some pr protections. It's it's not an indefinite that we situation. That change the whole theme of the school too. Correct. Absolutely, a lot a lot can happen over time. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, the other thing to keep in mind here, we're talking about something that would not occur for at least three years. Right. Now, if you were to move uh, Columbus to the Ely site, it would not occur for at least five years. And we, we're gonna have to, we would have to assess the situation at that point in time. Three to five years, you know, a lot of changes can, can occur. Okay, any other questions about Brian? Okay, well thanks Brenda. I think that was really helpful to have that kind of community input on the survey. There's a way higher numbers than it looked like we were going to get. The survey has now been closed. So these are the standing results uh, that we'll be working with as a guide towards community input, which we have vowed to, to go for. And you know, we've had meetings in South Park, we now have surveys, uh, and this will all factor into our uh, decision process. Uh, I think now we will go back uh, to, we'll not go back to, we'll go to uh, the fourth topic, uh, which is the Ponus Ridge project. Um, the superintendent will be talking about what the magnet school potential there would be, and uh, what the structure of the school would be. And uh, Mr. Zuber here is going to go over kind of the demographic data, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the, the site, as it is one of our biggest site out there. So I think we're on 4A, review, discussion of proposed exactly. magnet school theme, curriculum issue, and resource uh, requirements. So I'm passing around to you some uh, discussion notes. And Tom, if you could share those with uh, the public as, as, as well. So here is a vision for a K-8 elementary STEM campus. First of all, we are identifying STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math, because we are seeking in another part of the uh, facilities plan to reduce Jefferson to a 400 student neighborhood school. 
And as you know, we have the aberration there of 600 and some odd students with over 200 of them housed in 12 temporary classrooms in the, in the back of the school. So we're seeking to, uh, to correct that. And one of the clear objectives of the plan is to renovate Jefferson as new in phase two of the building program and return it to neighborhood school status. However, because Jefferson is a science magnet, right? Now, you know, I have to tell you, the, the science magnet, even in and of itself, if it was, if it was robust, is, would be outdated. You know, it's a concept of 20 years ago. The concept now is STEM or STEAM, if you could afford to have the arts as, as, as well. Um, but, uh, you know, in discussing this with the principal, it's also clear that the, what has become known as the magnet program at Jefferson is basically a science field trip program. Jefferson does not teach science any more or any differently than any other school. They all use old textbooks. And we have not yet gotten to the curriculum of, of, of the next generation uh, science standards. Uh, but what Jefferson does have now, it has field trips to the Maritime Aquarium, Nature's Classroom, and there's one other group that is involved. But it's all those folks coming to the school and then the students going on a, on a field trip. Um, so, you know, our intent here would be to update and build on the science magnet theme and create a real STEM school. So. Uh, let's take a look at how that would look at a, in a K-8 elementary campus. And as you know, uh, Ponis is our is the largest land holding, 65 acres. So there's room to do almost anything there that one one could imagine. Um, we're we're recommending that to develop a K-8 campus, we divide this into two schools: a 450 student K-5 lower school and a 600 student, 6-8 uh, upper school. So let's look at what the upper, the lower school might look at like. This would be the elementary school. It would have a STEM focus and theme replacing the uh, science uh, magnet uh, currently at, at Jefferson. Lottery preference would be given to current Jefferson students. Now that would be a mix not only of Jefferson neighborhood students, but students who are currently at Jefferson for the mag uh, prior to enrollment being closed, which was, was, was this year, because, because of the numbers we had to close enrollment. Um, Jefferson would then be enabled to return to its former K-5 neighborhood school status of 400 students and renovated as new in phase two of the building program. Now here are some STEM components at the uh, lower elementary level. Uh, daily instruction in experiential science. <coughs> experiential science is a very different approach than what we are used to in science instruction. The major um, uh, trainer of teachers in experiential science in Connecticut is the Connecticut Science Center in, in Hartford. And they have trained the staff of virtually every STEM school in the state of Connecticut that has opened as a magnet uh, so far. This is a, a major commitment. It's a three-year training program. But in experiential science, students approach almost any problem by gathering data, analyzing the data, and drawing a conclusion. Uh, at the end of three years of training, the school would have its own science units that are aligned to the next generation science standards and would virtually be te textbook free, not, not dependent on textbooks. They would use a variety of of materials. It would take about three years to accomplish that, as it has in other places in, uh, in, in Connecticut. Um, the uh, ELA and math instruction <coughs> would remain the same primarily in grades K through 3, where students are learning skills. But at the point a, a student uh, has learned to read and is now reading <coughs> to learn, uh, we would have an infused or aligned uh, curriculum in science. So in other words, the things that one would read in ELA in grades four and five would be science-oriented trade books. Uh, math would be oriented and aligned toward uh, science uh, topics and, and projects and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, we would have something that our district has had no experience in so far, 
and that would be an elementary engineering program. And the national model for this is called the EIE. Again, it's a staple in STEM schools in Connecticut and, and throughout the, the country. Generally, a, a, this type of school would have a Legos lab for the youngest children, uh, K, K2, and there is a whole Legos engineering curriculum, believe it or not. Uh, these things are wonderful if you, if you ever go into a, a, a Legos lab. Um, we would have an engineering lab for uh, students in grades three through six. Technology would be integrated throughout the curriculum at a higher level than other schools, but there would also be a technology lab. So this is not a school that would have separate science labs. Every classroom would have tables and chairs as opposed to desks and chairs and a sink where most science instruction could occur. Uh, but there would be a technology lab that you would go to where you're going to use on an infrequent basis some of the higher levels of technology and some of the gadgets <coughs> and, and, and um, technological innovations that, are, uh, that, that would be necessary to check certain experiments and, 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 and so on. Uh, and generally these schools at the elementary level would have a creatures lab or an earth science lab where the animals would be and you know students would care for these animals and they would uh, enter into you know experiments in genetics and other kinds of, of, of uh, uh, earth science and other kinds of uh, uh, things. So I think one of the um, strengths of going in the STEM direction is that we have natural, national exemplars, we have uh, schools in Connecticut, we have schools nationally that can be modeled. So it's very easy to answer the question, of what does an elementary STEM school look like and what, what should we do? A very big teacher training commitment here, particularly at the, uh, at the elementary level, uh, where we would have to solicit staff that are willing to take the training, it's three, three summers, uh, and willing to stay in the school and make a long-term commitment uh, to, to the school. But again, we have lots of STEM interest among our, our, our faculty currently, so I don't think that would be uh, difficult to do. The upper school would be 600 students. <clears throat> now, this, is, this would be sized relative to our capacity needs. Um, so it too would have a STEM focused theme and a continuation of the uh, lower school. We would give lottery preference to lower school students. So anyone who completed the lower school would have first preference into the upper school. We would also give preference to Kendall and Jefferson students uh, because that's their school currently. Now the other feeder to PONUS is, um, is Brookside. And Brookside, I'm sorry, um, Fox, Run. Fox, Run. Fox Run, thank you. And Fox Run is equidistant between West Rocks and Ponus. So those families probably should have a choice of West Rocks or, or, or Ponus. Um, the, um, the lottery, we would have a second lottery. We'd have one lottery coming into pre-K and K, and we would have a second lottery grade six. So the enrollment of the school would, um, would go up in grade six to accommodate middle school students who would lottery in for, for middle school. PONUS would be reduced from its current nine sections per grade to eight sections per grade. And in terms of the building program, three of the classrooms would be able to be converted to specialized STEM spaces or uh, laboratories. I think it's important to point out uh, also that any laboratory situation in either school should be used K through 8 to the extent possible by, by all students because these are expensive investments and something that you want full, full utilization of uh, once the investment of the building program. If you look uh, at the, on the flip side of this page, you'll see some of the STEM program components at the upper elementary level. Six through eight would include integrated math and science lessons. Uh, there's actually this I, EYE program that uh, is developed in which math and science are not separate subjects, but they're integrated in, in a, a larger block of time in the middle school uh, curriculum. Um, interdisciplinary units of instruction. Uh, are very appropriate in a STEM school for uh, middle grade or, or uh, uh, 
trans adolescent students, project-based learning, the engineering program in the middle grades is Project Lead the Way. Um, we would have innovative technology, uh, connectivity to other STEM schools internationally, so students could contact students in another country that are working on the same problem, or same experiment, and share what they are doing. This also is the bridge for second language instruction that begins in, um, in, in middle school. Um, and uh, the school would offer robotics, and horticulture would also be an aspect of this, developing some of the outside property that, uh, that exists there for, for STEM uh, uh, purposes. Um, so that's kind of the overview of the, of the uh, uh, upper school. Um, a number of the STEM supporting facilities in each building would be shared, a K-8. Uh, and again, you know, if there was a planetarium, all, all these things cost money. This is in, in many respects going to be a cost consideration, but <clears throat> there are many STEM accoutrements that, that uh, are found in, in STEM schools and could be added, a planetarium, gardens, labs, etc. to the extent possible. We would want those shared between the two buildings, K through eight. Um, the STEM program <coughs> costs uh, would be supported by a 1,000 per student intra-district magnet school allocation. Board members are familiar with this concept. I mentioned it to you last year <coughs> as a budget goal for this year. When I recommend the budget to you, you're going to see this in areas that where it's necessary, so, um, dual language at Silverman. Um, the, the uh, Bank Street program for, uh, for Columbus. Um, it is unrealistic for us to think that we can have a magnet and not pay for program costs. And so there have been criticism of our magnets as being magnets in name only or very, very watered down. And that's because these schools are struggling with the, with the money that they have available to provide a basic program of instruction like every other school. So if we want to have program costs and do things that are unusual and interesting and innovative and add value to our children's education, we have to be able to cover program costs. By comparison, our state intra our state inter district magnets provide a state grant of three thousand dollars per student. That's what's received by the Center for, for Global Studies currently. But of the two hundred magnet schools in the state. They all receive 3000 for program costs. I can't see us doing this at all without a $1,000 allocation for, for program costs. Um, so that's a little bit of, the, of an overview on uh, the theme, curriculum issues, and resource uh, requirements. We would also need a different form of uh, administrative organization. Uh, in this school. Generally, a STEM school will have a coach, a STEM coach, um, a magnet theme coach whose job is to keep the program on tact and to ensure that there is fidelity to the program for, for all students. Um, we would envision uh, a head, uh, similar to how private schools are organized, we would envision a, um, a lower school head and an upper school head. It might be something in the equivalent to the assistant principal or house master um, uh, uh, position, and then a, a principal of the, uh, of the entire uh, campus. So that's a little bit of unpacking of the STEM uh, concept. Um, I stayed away from STEAM for two reasons. Uh, one, I didn't think we could fit it into our short elementary day. And I think uh, our labor contract in term with the NFT in terms of time is going to be a tough nut to crack that is going to require time and, and several years to, to accomplish. Um, but also the additional investment in the arts uh, certainly takes this way over the $1,000 per student uh, level. And I think it's important that at least initially uh, we treat our magnets equally and value each child equally in terms of uh, their, their family's choices. And, uh, um, uh, questions from the committee? Uh, uh, how many uh, students are at Ponis right now? About 700 some odd students? Uh, uh, high sixes. Yeah. Oh, high six? 
and then the, they'll be phased out slowly to bring them down to the six. Well, there's pro there's there's on a practical basis there's about seventy <coughs> to seventy five students involved in three sections, right? And it, it, this is really a distribution issue uh, because in the previous discussion we've had, we talked about adding three <coughs> sections to Roten, and there would be three less sections uh, at, at Ponis. So we have, we have that as the offset. But in addition to that, there will be about uh, 50 students who would not be going to any middle school because they would be remaining at Columbus uh, in the K-8 month. And what, Stephen, in terms of where does that lead Jefferson? Would that be just a neighborhood school? And then, then that would lead Jefferson at approximately 400. As a conventional? As a conventional neighborhood school. I think that covers a lot of the ground we wanted to cover. Um, if Mr. Zuba, if you want to go over the kind of demographically where these students would be coming from. Yeah, looking at Jefferson and talking about the reduction in size down to about 400 students, um, we looked at having some logical boundaries there, especially with the return to a conventional neighborhood school of using I-95 as that really the first starting point of that um, and seeing if we were to divide Jefferson as sort of a north and south um, what would be the distribution of students. So when we look at the area of Jefferson, which is the arrow points to when it's highlighted in the uh, darker red color and the lighter, I guess it would be like a grayish green color. Um, we have currently about 437, 440 pre-K-5 students in there. 86% um, are minority, so it's right on that um, threshold of where we want them to be for our target for racial balance. Um, three quarters of those uh, attend Jefferson currently, so um, about 350 students, 340 students um, currently attend Jefferson with uh, several others attending, smattering of other schools and the largest being Silver Mine and Kendall. So um, looking at the reduction of that area, that could be the potential of being able to begin the alignment of, uh, of a neighborhood school there, looking at the Jefferson North. And uh, going ahead and taking a look at the uh, area south of 95 for Jefferson's much smaller area, but it's pretty compact. Um, there's currently 206 students that reside within that Jefferson South Zone, as we'll call it, about 82% are minority students and about 74% um, slightly lower than 78% currently uh, currently attend Jefferson there with 6% uh, attending Kendall and Fox Run. This is the area right around Columbus currently. Yeah, just, it, you could actually pick out Columbus's uh, uh, touching the wrong the little, little red one up there. That's when I touched loud. It must have been Tom that turned it off on me. Um, Columbus, <laughs> Columbus, Columbus is actually right here. Um, so, you know, it, it definitely is proximate, but there is a pretty large density of stuff <coughs> right in this area there as well. We were just throwing out some ideas there on kind of how that could fit in, whether or not that area would makes sense as being one of those feeders if you were to retain the north area um, for the Jefferson Neighborhood School. Um, and hearing what Dr. Adam Oski said about providing preference to those Jefferson students there, there could be some opportunity there, especially for that south area, which really wouldn't fit in with the north area, whether they would become part of the magnet at Columbus or potentially could be the seed for the uh, elementary component over at the uh, New Ponis School would you know, still to be worked out. Um, but we found that with the 200 students, there could be a good start at working your way to, to uh, you know, populating the, uh, the Ponis School. Um, just taking a look at that south area too, um, when we looked at sort of how the feeder pattern, knowing that you'd be having some conversations on, uh, on ultimately reducing some of the size of Ponis. They, they currently feed Ponis Ridge, um, what some potential options are based on proximity. Um, it's very proximate to three of the other uh, middle school feeders, whether that's Roten, as we discussed, um, Nathan Hale, or uh, or even being able to send up to, I think it was, uh, sending up to uh, West Rocks. Um, so there is some opportunities there to be able to, you know, better balance the uh, middle school population as well, because it is kind of like a whole wedge area for the uh, middle school feeder pattern. Um, Mike, I know you had asked some specific questions on uh, on the demographics as it pertains to racial balance. Um, what we did was we pulled together from the information we had at hand, um, really taking a look at the last five years, 
um, with the data that we had, and we created these stacked bar charts just to illustrate the uh, race and ethnicity and what are some of the trends um, that jump out currently. We're at 69% overall for the entire school system. That percentage has grown over the last five years where we were at low 60s back in 2011. What the trends are that we're seeing, um, the top bar chart then the blue color are really those, um, those, um, those white students, Caucasian students, anybody who identifies as something other than um, you know, uh, Latino, Hispanic, Black, Asian, or, or other. That number has slightly decreased over the uh, over the last year, but over the last six years of data that we have, it has decreased by about 500 students. We've seen the largest growth um, in the Hispanic population there in, in the yellow, as is no surprise with what we're seeing um, statewide and in many of the urban communities. That growth has been about 1,100 students um, with, we've and we've seen some decline as well um, in the African American population with the other populations remaining fairly stable. Uh, one of the other questions that you asked is, uh, you know, where is, what direction is that going? And that's very tough to gauge um, without really getting into a detailed survey. But um, from the data points that we had, we, we had birth data as reported by the mothers uh, with addresses in Norwalk. It doesn't pick up tremendously on immigration, not many things do pick up on moving populations, but um, some trends definitely have established. Um, we've highlighted the current K-5 population. Um, this is the area where you've seen your largest increase of minority births. Um, you've gone from, in 2003, 2004, from just under 50% at 49%, um, crossing that threshold to a pretty consistent 54, 55%, which then coincides with that boost that we've seen for the uh, for the population of minority students in the chart above. And with the latest data points that we've had, that 54.55 is maintaining until we get to 2014, where we saw that number slightly dip down to uh, around the 2005 level of 52%. Um, so kind of looking into our crystal ball there, um, what we're assuming is that that number is going to maintain fairly steadily, uh, very, fairly steady at around 69%. We could see some modest growth there, but overall what, what, we're, what we're seeing is not the dramatic growth that we've seen over the last two years. Great. Um, before I get into some questions, you also had some additional information that we put in the packet as well. Um, looking at the projections out to 21-22, uh, we provided that information from the projections we prepared as part of the master plan. We are currently in the process of Update, updating those projections this week for the uh, for the budget cycle. But going back to our projections, we're seeing overall the uh, the population be very steady. You're looking at about um, level numbers for the entire system. Um, we're seeing some very modest decline in the total elementary numbers in the <coughs> next five years. The middle school numbers are maintaining um, their level, but we're seeing growth in the high school numbers as those larger class sizes that are currently in middle again matriculating through. I know we um, had one of our high schools, you know, we've gone to the student-based budgeting system. One of our high schools, their enrollment came in 100 kids more than what you thought it was going to be this year. Yeah, right. So, yeah. So I don't know, I didn't look to see kind of what your projections have been for Norwalk High, if that was just a kind of a shift, or if we've we really seen we faster saw growth than maybe you had anticipated. No, in, in, in part it's a shift, but we think there's something else there. Um, what we're doing now is we're looking at students that um, may have been new arrivals or, or, or new admissions over the course of the year, see if that was the driving factor or if there was a particular program or need that was driving that number as well. So we'll get an answer on that. Yeah, the, the actual uh, projections versus enrollment, the projections were spot on. They were, I think, within three students. Right. Overall, the numbers were yeah. almost exactly uh, right on there. The Brian McMahon situation does represent a shift because Norwalk High School is yeah. down. Uh, while Brian McMahon is up. Uh, there's, there appear to be several factors at work. Uh, some students are avoiding, some families are avoiding middle school and going to Brian McMahon for, for high school. So you see an increase uh, there in the ninth grade cohort being much larger than the, the eighth grade uh, cohort. Uh, immigration is currently playing a, a role. Um, Brian McMahon has become the school of choice for immigrants. It's a very supportive environment. Uh, many have been extremely successful there. Uh, and uh, people are gravitating uh, uh, 
to it. It's a, uh, you know, it's really an international uh, school. It, it probably uh, 20, 30 countries are represented there now in terms of student, uh, uh, student background. So um, uh, immigration is a factor. The excellence of the school is a factor. I expect this may increase further when the IB program is established uh, next, next year. So, um, you know, you, you have a, a school that has just been very good in, 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 a, in a number of respects. Yeah, I mean, just talking about that as an aside, when you think about it, we had a, three, four years ago, we had a student from Haiti who came from after the earthquake, didn't speak English, went to Princeton. Uh, last year, we had a girl go to Harvard from, I think she's Colombian. Mm -hmm. uh, the year before that, we had a boy who was from Panama who went to Harvard. Um, so there, there is definitely a success story for new, new, new immigrants' families. And, you know, as the valedictorian said, uh, it was a very supportive environment, and she could not have, as an immigrant student, uh, she didn't think be successful uh, to that degree any, anywhere else. Okay, well, great. So you're still like reviewing your numbers, and they're <coughs> yeah. subject to to change. Change. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts on all the construction that's happening in the city and how that might affect uh, immigration? Yeah. In terms of not because of the, not the birth rates, in terms of people moving into the city. Yeah. When we had done our projections as part of the master plan, we reviewed all the developments that were on the books at the time that those were either construction planned or even permitted. And we built those into the numbers with what we thought the student generation would be. Um, but those are mostly coming in, not this year, but in that really four to ten year window out um, when likely they get fully occupied and you realize how many, fully realize the number of students that would be in those units. So we have included those in the number. So it's almost like a wait and see kind of thing right now, right? It's wait and see. We've added, um, so you traditionally rely on the cohort survival as um, Dr. Amowski mentioned, you know, we have an increased number of students, so you rely on persistency ratios from one year to the next, ninth grade to tenth grade, what the historic number is. Um, what we do is when we know we have developments that are breaking ground, we know the numbers of bedrooms, we know the type of units, and then we basically comp them against similar units to see how many kids actually come out of them, and we'll adjust those numbers, and we'll add them to that base forecast to ensure that, you know, we're not caught off guard by something that's being built. Well, thank you. We get some feedback from the committee, and we want to make sure we're on the right track with planning now. Uh, you only have one more meeting, and um, that is going to be focused on South Norwalk, on the Ely and Columbus sites. Um, and you know, we'll be making similar presentations, recommendations, and, and, and so on. Um, but in terms of a POTUS, are we on the right track? Is this something? you feel comfortable recommending to the full board as, as part of phase one? I think there hasn't been any controversy. There is a, a second lane out here, uh, kind of just that Tom was going right, to gonna potentially gonna review. I'm going to wrap up uh, the formal discussion with a discussion of some of the site issues, which is um, uh, stuff that's already been presented to you previously uh, by Silver Petrus. Uh, Petroselli, but uh, you know, just sort of in context of the discussion that we've now had on what the plan is for Ponus, we wanted to reiterate uh, uh, the attributes of uh, the site and talk about uh, some of the circulation issues and so forth that I know there's been some uh, questions about. So uh, that's yeah. I what apologize. I'm I, I missed the team. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so if you. I don't know if there are any questions. I, I, you know, if there are questions of Mike, maybe they're appropriate now, and then I'll jump in to wrap up uh, the presentation. Sure. Well, I think the committee has their questions have been answered from the demographic side. I don't know if there's anyone in the audience that had any questions uh, that wanted to ask anything about his figures or forecasts. Okay. Um, yeah, I've got, got a couple of questions. Uh, limited right now to the forecast. Mm -hmm. I'll do them writing afterwards. I've got a number of questions, but this is the first I've had a chance to take a look at this. Um, I, had, I had a number of questions. I even went back to the, to the survey, just 
because um, I know that there's certain things we're using as the basis for the decisions that you need to make. Um, and if I have the liberty, I'll ask some of those questions. For example, um, the, the, the the number of, parent, of parents that responded were from um, the, the zones that were called unassigned. Uh, and I don't have the survey in front of me. Was there an actual question to ask people? Were they from an unassigned area? And if so, how did they know? Um, the question asked, do you reside in one of the areas that is um, considered unassigned as part of the school district and then it listed the addresses that are part of that. Okay. So, so they have the guidance of okay. whether or not. So. Do you have any other questions? Um, yeah, the rest of them I have to, I just have to digest this a little bit, a little bit more. Okay. Um, well, in fact, if I do look at the, the actual projected enrollments though, uh, the sheet, I think the last sheet that you had up there, um, if I'm, if I'm looking at the K, K through 5, I'm reading this accurately, that you're around like 5,000 students? Yeah. Okay. And that pretty much stays the same across, across the level for all the, all the years there afterwards? Or the it's about the peak? Yeah, it's about the peak. Um, let me just pull it out of my detailed projections. And I'm asking because most of the models you're looking at are whether you're doing pre-K through five or eight, um, and, and this is being done because of the additional enrollment. So, I'm trying to determine if we actually reached our peak of K five at that point. According to this, according to their demographic number, yes, yeah. this coming year would be the peak. All right. So, yeah. so, so we'll remain the same. So that in the number, if I, because it's kind of, it's been. Looks like it evolves a couple times on me. The current number that we're calling over enrollment, because sometimes I've heard it's 750, sometimes 900. What is the actual current over enrollment at the kindergarten, at the pre K through 5 level right now? District wide? Yeah. Well, I think what the, that number of 900, um, I think, includes the students that are in portables. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, we have 15. Those portables. those portables are at the end of their design life. Right. So, but the question I'm asked specifically, at the pre-K through five level, because if 900, that would include your middle and high schools, am I correct? Because that's your overall I, 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 excess, I, 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 excess over enrollment. Um, counting the pulling off of all the portables, it was just under 800 students for uh, 740 to 799 students for this year. So about just under 800 students okay. is the deficit that proceeds. And not that I'm advocating that right now, they say that we do nothing, but that, so we can understand that that's the number now, and that's the number that we would not expect to increase because we're well, already no, at that right projections are projected to increase. I mean, at the uh, at, at they're going up at the rate of about 200 students per year. Yeah, we're, well, the, what we're seeing over the next five years is a very shallow sort of that troughing as you had some larger classes come through. But then we're seeing out in the early, um, right around the time or just shortly after when the school construction program would be completed, comes back up on the uptick again, and peaks in 25 and 26 at about 5,360 students. So it would be about a, a hundred more um, than what we're showing on the- uh, That's at the elementary on, level, right? On, yeah, on the current, for, for the uh, projected for next year of 17, 18. Um, but that's out 25 and 26. So even though it dips back down to 5,000 and remains there pretty steady, we are seeing that uptick and that's largely when you have the culmination of a lot of the uh, development that's in the planning, proposal, permitting stage, they really get fully occupied, as well as some projected uptick in, uh, in immigration and birds from the beginning of what year? We're seeing the uptick starting in about, well, depending on the scale of an uptick, say 22, 23, and then increasing about 100 students per year out to uh, 25, 26. Right. I am I am reading this accurately when I look at the table below that gives me like the 2019-20 year, like I said, pre-K through 12 total, it was like 11,541, and that was the entire... That's the entire system. Yeah, I was just speaking directly right. to the elementary enrollment. Right. So if I, if I go to enrollment for that same year, then it was 5,078. So for the year thereafter, which would be 2021, we actually, the number was lower by about 22 students, correct? I'm reading that accurately? Yeah, it's 36. 
Right, we went from 5,078 down to 5,056. And then down to 5,042. And then, and then, down, and then we continue to go down. So at the elementary yeah. level, we're actually going down year by year, at least for those years. No, it, 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 it bottoms. It's, that's sort of the trough. It's the bottom of the projection. What we're seeing is starting year 22, 23, which isn't shown on the five years of the chart. We're looking at an enrollment uptick, and it begins increasing then for about 100 per year every year after that out to 25, 26. And that, that's the limit of what we're able to project at this okay, time. Okay, and I just want to make sure I'm clear. And that's 100 per year, not district, but 100 per year at the elementary. Just at the elementary level. Yes. Um, other question I've, I've got to ask is earlier in the presentation, uh, there was a number that was given for the target uh, where, when you kept something about you achieved minority percentage, and it was always at 85%. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if the district wide is 69%. Yeah, the mean. The, it's the district wide average of light grades and how they're grouped so according to the state racial balance law. Um, you're, there's two levels. There's um, If you're at 15% is one of the critical thresholds of where you begin put on notice. You're not required to draft a plan, but that's sort of the mark that we use that number slightly there above. So anywhere between 15 percent from that deviation um, you're, 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 you're in good standing with the state but then when you begin getting the 15 to 25 percent you begin increasing of where you have a call for action or drafting yeah, 20 to 20 percent yeah. right yeah. 20 percent yeah. so I, I guess that's why I'm questioning whether I'm understanding this properly or not because it looks like you're, you're actually using the higher number as the target for where you actually want to bring your balance rather than rather than using the mean if if we were to try to bring the balance to the mean um, at every given school, which isn't required by law, um, you would have a very difficult time in sizing the school and balancing the neighborhood needs versus the out of neighborhood needs in order to meet that meet that mandate. You would have to have all schools magnets. They, they would have to yeah. be completely, you know, mixed. <laughs> but, but if we if we built a school or did these modifications to a school and automatically used a number that's already on the edge of where you're going to be cited, um, you have no room for growth or mobility or changing or anything. Because it's going to and be... Changing demographics. It, because it's going to be largely governed by a magnet component, you do, you, you do have control of it. Um, if we were not to have any choice or magnet component at all, as we showed in the earlier iteration, we would be near 96%, which would be very far out of whack from where that average is. Um, I mean, I think the answer is, Bruce, that we want to have neighborhood schools as much as possible. So yes, we are pushing the envelope so it can be as much of a neighborhood school as possible. If we went to the district-wide average, then you're still going to be busing a ton of kids all over the city. And our whole point of doing this was not to be busing kids over the city or to pass fewer kids than we currently are. And it, this is going to be, as you look at our strategic operating plan, this is going to be a district of choice. Kids don't want to go to neighborhood school. They want to go to a magnet school. They're going to be able to. Uh, well, if it's going to be a district of choice, that will automatically necessitate that you're going to have a lot of buses. Um, we have Dr. Adam Osti said yet. something at the beginning of this, I think it was a very key point, and one I hold to believe to be true, uh, that, that any one thing you do, that's all integrated. Uh, it's not like if you just do something Ely, you, you, that doesn't affect whatever you're going to do at Jefferson or whatever you do at Ponis. Whatever you do at one place is going to affect it. And I've actually been an advocate that we do look at the entire system because we have some other schools that have very, a lot lower percentages when you try to work towards getting balance. Um, and, and, and quite frankly, back in 2003, 2004, we looked at those schools. And for the same thing we're trying to accomplish here, we looked at there and we said, listen, why shouldn't those be a magnet that we're attracting people across the city to want to go to? Because when we speak specifically to the issue of busing, um, people don't mind busing their kids to Columbus from all over the city because there's a phenomenal program there. So I don't think the issue is busing. I think it's what you've said in your strategic operating plan. You want to be able to provide high quality schools no matter where they are. You can use themes, you can do whatever is necessary and provide resources for kids. So the location may not be so much the issue. So, so that, that's why I'm bringing this up because um, if we're at the key, if we're at 86%, you're, you're, I mean, and you'll get a chance to answer this, Dr. Adamowski, wouldn't we then be forced by your lottery, you're gonna be changing whatever that lottery's gonna look like every couple of years, who gets choice, who doesn't get choice. Um, okay, I'll let you answer from there. 
Well, I mean, you're, you're correct. Everything is connected to everything else. But it is also moving in a direction, right? Our minority enrollment is increasing. Mm -hmm. And as it increases, we will have to make adjustments up until the 75% level. At the 75% level, it doesn't matter. The state is not concerned with racial balance. You, you have, uh, when you have 75% minority students, nothing can be balanced. These are all uh, majority minority uh, schools under the state. Uh, until we are at that point, and we're, you know, we're currently at around 68%, um, the racial balance guidelines will prevail, and we can go down 15% or up 15%, uh, which means the lowest you can go is where Columbus is now at about 56%, and the highest you can go is where Silvermine is now as a dual language school, which is about 85%. Uh, percent. Um, you know, there are, in any building program, you know, this is a tremendous outlay of public money, right? So we have to have primary objectives, but we also have to have some secondary objectives. And we have to try to accomplish as many good things as we can for the public investment involved. So this is about the need for 900 new seats. But it's also about um, a choice program in which the primary aspect of choice is, have, is every family having the default choice of a good neighborhood school in their neighborhood. Uh, another objective is reducing transportation. <coughs> we are way over the state average in transportation. Uh, we're busing 8,000 students uh, every single day. All right? We're at about 80%. The state average is at 50%. <clears throat> that should not be surprising in a district that does not have a school in its most populous, fastest growing area, right? Should not come as a surprise to us. It should not as come as a surprise to us that we're doing that in a district that actually has students unassigned, not assigned to any school. And as Mr. Barber said, has been filling in in terms of space available in, in, in various places. Now, these are not normal situations. They, they are aberrations that grew up for good reason at a certain point in time, but that point in time has changed, and it will be changing in the future. And we have to make these adjustments as, um, as those demographic changes occur and, 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 we, and we go along. So I think it's very important that we look at the choice goal in our strategic operating plan to realize that you can only have some choices if you have the default of a good school in your, in your neighborhood. Um, and secondly, we have to become more normal in terms of transportation. And we have the CDC telling us, you know, the, be the best thing you can do for a young child's health is enable them to walk to school or to take, the, to take uh, a bicycle uh, to school. And so all these things are important factors in a community. We can't just focus on one goal. We have to do things that create a better condition in a number of areas simultaneously. And that's really our jobs, your job, um, you know, as, as we look at these recommendations. So, so, then, so then, then, then I was correct to understand that 85%, so if you look at adoption two for yearly, that 85% would be your target of where you would want to go. Um, and I understand a couple different options of whether you're going to uh, MOU with the Maritime or someone, if that's what you're going to do. And that's a document that can um, change every two to three years. Um, Dr. Adam is recommending $1,000 per student for, for, um, for magnet schools. Or if we have a school that's automatically starting out 85% minority, and it's, it only has $1,000 per student, um, and you can change that, that and, and the MOUs, however your arrangements are going to change every year. What, what, we all understand the kids who are, who are in poverty. You have a school that's largely kids who are in poverty. We're not going to deal with the race. We're just with just poverty. Um, that school requires more resources. So certainly, you're talking a thousand dollars just to help to do some programmatic things that would encourage other parents to want to have their kids to go there. And a school that would have additional needs just based on the number of kids coming out of poverty. I think there's enough that shows that you would need additional dollars in most of the schools. Yeah, I, I think I can answer that question, Bruce. The, yeah. uh, 
thousand dollar supplement is a magnet school supplement mm -hmm. specifically to fund the additional program expenses of the magnet school the school would still receive the regular per student allocation of uh, you know roughly currently sixty five hundred dollars per student and in addition a school that has a uh, you know meets the threshold requirements for title one funding which uh, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, free and reduced uh, lunch uh, eligibility would be the primary criteria going into that. Would also have supplemental funding for to address the poverty issues uh, uh, related uh, 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 with those students. So there are substantial additional funds that obviously would be needed to run the school. The additional thousand dollars is really just a supplement uh, to to uh, support the additional program costs associated with the magnet program. So a school in our district qualifies to be a Title I school by having more than 50% of its students eligible for free and reduced lunch. So we have six Title I elementary schools and we have two Title I middle schools. So that those funds are designated to be additional funding for students in high poverty uh, schools. Uh, now in addition to that, we have the Priority School District Grant and our alliance grant, which tangentially are also designed to provide uh, support for those students that need more support. This is how uh, we should be funding our tier two and tier three interventions. Um, and which is why it's important that we, and board members know this, that we take these other things that have gotten into those grants over time uh, out so that we have that capacity for the neediest students in our, our district um, and you know again given that we're in a very fortunate position to have um, very significant state funding thanks to our legislature um, to uh, to be able to uh, to do these things but I think Bruce the thing you have to realize is we have 11,500 students mm -hmm. roughly 6,000 of those kids are on free and reduced lunch only 2,000 of those 6,000 kids, not even not less than 2,000, are from South Norwalk. Mm -hmm. They're kids of low income throughout the city. It is not just a South Norwalk issue. Oh, I, I, I trust me, I fully understand. And that's why I'm bringing up the issue that it isn't just, for me, it isn't just the South Norwalk school. It is all of the schools that the kids who come from out of poverty go to. Um, because of, from my view, uh, when, when you begin to take a look at the schools that have the largest percentage of free and reduced um, students and, and largely of color. Um, and we can probably take a look at it. Uh, when it comes to testing and everything else, there are more challenged schools. All right, and, and all the research and everything else, and those are huge situations that need more resources in order to offset that. So we've already got Title I that we've been doing. We've already got priority school district funding that we've been doing. I, what I'm suggesting is this board seriously consider that if you're going to take a look at a model where you're going to really take and increase your density of population of kids that are poor uh, into a situation that they're going to continue f forever now because to be in a, in a school that's going to continue to be largely poor and of color, that we need to make certain we're putting something in place now to make certain that, those, that there are additional resources there to make certain that those kids could be successful. And because Five years from now, maybe a different board. Ten years from now, a different board, different superintendents. And when budgets change. I know you've been talking about this, but yeah. I don't see what you expect this board to do to provide guarantees for five or ten years from now. As I'll, give, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll give you a for instance. I'll give you a for instance. I'll, I'll give you a su suggestion of something. Uh, a couple Columbus Magnet School. It's additional dollars. Columbus Magnet School, when we desegregated our schools, we decided we're going to keep one school in the community. It was a magnet. And what did they get for doing that? They, they, they were given something extra. They did a Bank Street model, which is a model that also included them having an additional instructional aid. They're the only school that ended up having an instructional aid as elementary school. That's something good to have in a classroom. I'm pretty sure every school, I mean, that's additional support. Rather than reducing cl class sizes, and they've always, if I can recall correctly, I've had to reduce the size of a classroom that wasn't always as high as a lot of other places. Um, that's a better setting for kids in poverty. And there's a lot of other things that you can do to make certain that if you're going to be very deliberate about saying, I'm going to put all these kids, empowering kids who, who have a demographic that are, based on the demographic, are least likely to succeed, what are the things that we know, proven practices, that will ensure that they will succeed? And that this board can put cast in stone and you can do as part of that program now.
Okay, well, we thank you for your opinion. I think we'll listen to Tom talk about how opponents will look. I know there's some people from opponents here who would like to hear that. And um, then we can wrap this meeting up. Okay, I think I can probably walk through this pretty quickly. I think as it's already been um, indicated, uh, PONUS is in fact our largest uh, district uh, owned site or district controlled site of over 41 acres. Just to put that in perspective, uh, West Rocks uh, and Nathan Hale are both about 15 or 16 acres and Roten is less than that. So at 41 acres, this is a property that has the most room and most ability to accommodate any sort of expansion that uh, that we may be interested in uh, pursuing there. Uh, secondly, the building is situated on the highest elevation point on the property. There's, um, you know, significant uh, developable land there. There are some wetlands down in the <coughs> edges of the property and so forth, but the building is uh, located in the right place to support uh, further uh, uh, building expansion and in fact there is plenty of room for any building expansion that uh, that's uh, maybe uh, considered there. Uh, the site can accommodate uh, the needed safety improvements as you'll recall the original facilities study from Silver Petroselli uh, recommended uh, that for safety reasons and as well as traffic flow reasons it was important that we uh, move the district to uh, wherever feasible to segregated uh, access routes and drop-off points uh, between buses and parents. Uh, when these buildings were originally constructed, not that many parents drove their children to school. Now we know a lot of parents do drive their children to school, which causes traffic problems as well as uh, safety issues potentially with uh, young children, you know, getting off of buses, going the wrong way, and, and so forth. Uh, so uh, this uh, site does allow for separate and distinct uh, drop-off points for parents and buses as well as uh, separate and uh, distinct uh, access routes and drop-off points for the upper grades and the lower grades. And so that's important as well to keep the younger children segregated from the upper children. Um, the um, site also accommodates uh, and the uh, plan that uh, Silver Petroselli put together does provide for emergency vehicle ingress and egress from a different uh, uh, point uh, so that in the event of uh, some sort of uh, uh, serious situation at the school there's an additional way for emergency vehicles to get onto the site. It also provides for age appropriate uh, uh, the ability to accommodate age appropriate classrooms, educational spaces, out and outdoor play areas. Uh, when we say age appropriate classrooms and educational spaces, what we're talking about is the ability to segregate, again, the lower school children from the upper school children so that you don't have, uh, you know, problems with uh, younger children uh, getting, uh, you know, intimidated or whatever by older children. So the, uh, uh, this particular site and this particular building allows for uh, those uh, uh, segregation of uh, of uh, children as well as the creation of new spaces that we would need for the younger children for outdoor play areas, uh, grass areas, as well as paved areas, as well as uh, uh, out, uh, uh, playground uh, facilities uh, can also be accommodated. Uh, and the site allows for additional parking, uh, which would be required, as well as storm and water management. So all that fits onto the site. We've got a couple of schematics. The first one I'm not going to dwell on, but I wanted to put it here just, uh, again, this is a earlier iteration, so we put on the heading, this is the uh, what the superintendent had talked about with the uh, pre-K to 8 for, with three sections at the lower grades and eight sections, 6 through 8, accommodating a, a little over a thousand students. The layout below still needs to be updated by Silver Petroselli, but it does show I think what it shows is, is important is that the addition, which is in the colored portion of the building, how that's segregated from uh, the rest of the building, and there is additional room to, to expand that, uh, uh, that footprint of that new uh, construction as well. Um, the last side is the slide is the uh, conceptual site plan. Again, I want to talk about here this is the existing drive coming in, the existing building here, tennis courts over here, the new addition 
that's that I just showed you is down here and there is room to expand that further there's also room to potentially close the uh, uh, area between here or to add uh, an additional addition uh, between these buildings to create a courtyard area um, so the driveway circulation, again, right now the driveway comes in this way, you come around and you go out this way. This would be changed to a bus only entry and exit, provides for bus entry coming in, provides for a new separate bus drop off area, room to stack, uh, I, think, uh, I think it's uh, eight or nine buses here, so there's room for stacking of buses and then they can come and go back out the same way. Um, the, so that would be the drop-off for the lower school, if you will, and then uh, students going to the upper school, uh, the bus would come in here, drop off students here, and again, there's stacking area, I think it's for 11 buses, if I remember correctly, and then they would continue out around the parking area and back out the same driveway. The additional, there would be new additional driveway and parking area here. The driveway coming in here would be for parent drop-off, and again, there's plenty of room for uh, parent cars to stack up, drop off in front of the uh, new elementary building or lower school building here, circulate back out and out the same drive. And then for the upper school, the six to eight grades would use uh, the parent uh, access would be through here. Again, circulate around, plenty of room for stacking of cars, and then there's parking there and then back out the same drive. So again, that provides the important uh, uh, separation of the uh, buses from the parent drop-off, as well as the separation of the uh, upper school from the lower school uh, access. The emergency access would be in through here, uh, as well as a emergency uh, access around the back of the building. Uh, and again, that's an important safety consideration um, again, there are wetlands down at the back end of the property, on the edge of the property, uh, but they are <coughs> areas for stormwater management here. There's other areas here that could be used uh, for that purpose. Um, there is, uh, they built in uh, some additional play areas, uh, a playground area here. They built in a paved play area here and a grass play area here for the lower, uh, lower schools, so that is uh, you know new play areas that would be available so we think the site um, and, and again this is a rehash uh, to some degree from what Silver Petroselli previously presented but we think the site provides really one of our best opportunities from a site layout standpoint to uh, get the site you know the way that we want it to make the changes that we need to make so that we can uh, make uh, you know make the operation as successful and smooth as possible from an operational standpoint. Um, I think that pretty well concludes all I intended to go over here. I don't know if there's any other questions that you have. We have uh, Alan Lowe's here and Bill O'Dell is still here. Um, and we'll obviously try to answer any questions you might have on site layout consideration. Okay, so here in the audience we have George Andrew. It looks like he wants to ask a question. A teacher of POTUS who's also the number two in the NFT, as well as a member of uh, POTUS's school governance council to his left, Joe Perella. So one of the questions that we have that we're just trying to make sure, would POTUS be done first to be the swing space for Jefferson's remodel or the swing space for um, Columbus's, like, what if? Uh, no, it would be, uh, Potentially uh, swing space for the Jefferson remodel, not the Columbus remodel. The notion on Columbus is that Nathaniel Ely would be the swing space for Okay, so for we Columbus would go remodel. Ponus and build Nathaniel Ely move, so everybody moves from. You. No, um, we would build Ponus we would and, and Ely together at the same oh, time. Okay. Currently. And then you're done concurrently, and then the new space at Ponus, the you know, the K-5 magnet school, would be the swing space while Jefferson got, what was left of Jefferson got rebuilt. Okay. And then I just have a couple other quick questions. The one, this diagram, <coughs> the, the one with the classrooms laid out on Right, that's that's an older iteration, I understand. so that's not the... Uh, so that, right this now. is not really what we would do, because you're going to have, if we're spending all this time to build the addition and you would have pre-K first and second in a sense isolated you've now put third and fourth grade 
Could you go back to that slide, Tom? Sure. If, if I'm looking at the slide correctly, and I understand that there could be changes, third grade and fourth grade would be in what is old Ponus and would be the middle school or upper school would be moved to the second floor. Is that correct, the way this reads? That's the way this reads. But okay. again, this is not the... I, you know, this I, is not the proposed layout. I just want to make so sure that when do. people ask me, I'm able to give them that, but I'll also explain this is not the final right. thing. Silver Petroselli has to, we have to tell, we don't want to just kind of have mm -hmm. Silver Petroselli keep doing lots of different iterations, one after another, after right. another, after another. We want the committee to kind of coalesce around a, you know, expected solution and then have Silver Petroselli, um, you know, develop the schematic that supports that direction that, okay. that, that the board is moving in. And the last question I have with the emergency egress, and this is more of like an aesthetic kind of thing, the egress that goes down the hill, mm -hmm. um, that's literally like your feet from someone's house on that hill. Like right, I mean, you can kind of see the house there right. in the corner, but I mean, those people aren't going to complain. Is that going to be completely repaved? And the other part is, right. that, go that's behind be... the building for this part here past the media center, are we removing trees and making that area wider and paving it? Or is that just still the grass area that when we exit the building from an art room or a science lab currently, you're, and I'm touching a tree on the ridge as I walk around the building. So is that... Yeah, that, that's a level of detail that I'm not okay. sure I can answer. You know, I, we did have a uh, conference call with uh, John Ireland today, and he did indicate that, you know, with any project, you know, there, there could be a requirement to remove some rock and, and move, uh, you know, uh, earth around, and, and I presume there could be a requirement to remove some trees, but I, I can't speak specifically to a specific tree in a specific location. In that area, would this be, in a sense, like between the tennis court and the building, would that be fenced off because we're dealing with now forerunners and quads that are going back behind the building and tearing up the grass? So it's there's I, people I'm who are sure not part that of would school. be you know something that we could accommodate if that's an existing problem that we can solve through a construction project and some fencing. I would mm -hmm. sure we would do that. I did want to answer your first question in terms of the uh, emergency uh, mm -hmm. access and egress. That would be intended for uh, police, fire, mm -hmm. you know, responders, but it would basically, be and, and you know, it could be, you know, yeah, gate, even gated off so that it's uh, just emergency responders that could could access it. it. The intention is not that it would be used on a on a daily basis. All right. Thank you. Just if, if I could just go back to Mr. Jindrico's Ginger, second question, right? I think there is a. Um, significant financial issue that will have to be decided and determined regarding how much work is actually done to the interior parts. Right? So you've looked at the site, some of the site improvements uh, here. Uh, Ponis is our largest middle school. Uh, it is also our lowest income middle school. Now, I think this plan will help both of those issues because we, we will be taking out three classes or the equivalent of about 75 students. So that will help reduce the, the numbers a little bit. Uh, also, the fact that one of its feeders will be the lower school, which will be a um, citywide magnet, will help reduce the concentration of low-income students. So we'll get a better economic balance in the school uh, uh, overall. Uh, but what, you know, how the STEM program is developed, utilizing the space of those three rooms, um, is is a question. Um, does the rest of Ponis get updated? Um, is it, does it you know is it improved cosmetically? Um, there are you know I, I think we're we're able to estimate fairly clearly through you know the good auspices of our architect what the cost of being of building the the lower school would be, but I think it's a more open question relative to your values um, and community <coughs> desires in terms of what actually happens in the existing uh, Ponus building, because this, this would not be a renovation as new, but how far do you go? Do you do cosmetic improvement? Do you update uh, for code? Uh, 
I assume we would do that. Um, and then what is the uh, cost of, of actually having some value added STEM facilities in the, uh, in the school? My guess is some of that would come out in the, you know, the whole complex would be in the purview of the Ed Spec Committee and that they would have to make some of that determination versus us. I think we had already discussed that, you know, we would extend air conditioning, you know, since all our buildings were used this Yeah, summer. so air conditioning is a good example. Air conditioning, code, um, um, cosmetic work, that would not be within the purview of the Ed Spec Committee. Uh, they will be talking about the program. And it's possible that through the Ed Spec work, the um, STEM facilities in those three classrooms, or the equivalent of those three classrooms, however configured, would, would be addressed. But the rest of it is, uh, I think, an issue that uh, the, <coughs> the board will need to determine. Okay. Well, I guess we know what we have to do. When's the last time Paulus had a facelift? Uh, I would say 2007. Yeah, it's had, with the discussion we had with uh, John today was that overall the building is in reasonably good shape. I'm I'm looking at the uh, uh, one portion of the facilities yeah. plan. It did, you know, mention that there was um, 3.9 million dollars worth of capital needs that they had put in the capital needs bucket for bonus, and it included uh, you know 800 thousand dollars for toilet room renovation. So I think. You know the the bathrooms. I'm guessing are probably pretty dated in the building. Probably you can they're probably disgusting. answer better than us. But <laughs> they're, they're probably they're probably 1958. I mean, it's right. pink tile, blue tile. It's right. That's coming back in. You know. So <laughs> it's, 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 it's retro. Yeah, and I, I know that the plumbers and everybody they work very hard. But I mean, the sinks are the old school. Like I mean, they were the same sinks that were there when I went there, which was not for a very long time. <laughs> um, you brought up one question, Stephen, I was thinking was when Tom was talking about circulation of buses and so forth, would there be any chance the school, you, you, that might be a place where we could start with a longer school day or by then maybe we would have negotiated it in that the elementary school would run, you know, you kind of have a longer, you know, elementary would start with middle and they go longer in the day, something like I that? I think we have to seriously look at that. You know, it would be ideal in this campus to have the school day the same length of time for elementary and middle. Yep. And obviously we don't want to lower middle to the elementary, so this would mean, you know, how, under what conditions could we bring up uh, the elementary to a reasonable school day in a consistent program? And Mike, um, for the other, I could just ask, could you run through the numbers with us then <laughs> from this additional info sheet? This with the 2025 numbers, just because that's the end of your 10 year horizon. Is that it? Is that the last year you projected enrollment for? Yeah. So could you just give us those numbers? You gave us the 5360 for K5, but what PK12, K12, and 6 8 would be? for the middle at um, 20, uh, 2025-26 is uh, 2353 for the uh, ending point there. It should be noted that the middle does, however, peak in um, years 2021 at 20, actually 2019-20 at 20, uh, 2591 students. High school. I do not have the high school with me, unfortunately. Okay. I'll I, actually I'll email those out to you. If you could, tomorrow. just with that R, just so we can yeah. see, you know, where we, because or, or even do you have total enrollment, either PK 12 or K 12 for that 2025? If you had it, you would take it, but if not, we'll wait. Yes, I do. I do have it. Um, 
but it's not easily. I didn't. I don't have the final version with it all aggregated. All that's okay. I'd have to do some math, but okay. Um, I'm glad to shoot that up to you tomorrow. Okay, I appreciate that. Yes. And then, could you just put this in the context? I know your firm has done a lot of work around the whole state of Connecticut for a variety of both urban and suburban areas. Could you just touch on how I don't think I don't know if you did work for Stanford, but I know I think you did Meriden and some other. We've been working for Stanford, and Hartford. And could you just kind of give a context like what, what we look like like some of the other cities from what standpoint from a demographic student population growth um what we're seeing in you know Hartford aside that's a little bit of a different animal there with the uh, very regionalized school system same with New Haven but those that have some limited sort of magnet components to it um demographically your trends are kind of similar um Danbury seeing a, a, a level of growth um maybe a little higher than than Norwalk. Um, Waterbury saw growth five years prior, but it's been very flat right now. Mm -hmm. um, but they're also seeing that increasing diversity there as well. Um, Stanford has experienced you know, a lot of growth throughout the 2000s aligned with the boom in housing there, which happened a little earlier than here with you know, you're currently now going through the housing renaissance there. Um, some of the uh, areas that we had discussed in Stanford were the increasing diversity you know, the increasing needs, and uh, as Dr. Adamowski mentioned, they have a, a little bit of a unique system in how they handle their, their racial balancing component through that combination um, there. Um, where, where we see kind of Norwalk globally fitting in is one of those areas that, you know, really is sort of a landing point to some degree for some new arrivals. We pulled some recent information together and we saw Fairfield County is the only county in the state of Connecticut that saw any new immigration not just from international, but from other states um, over the last five years since the latest census. Um, so we see that as a sign of you know, what we're seeing at Norwalk schools with the growth and the increasing numbers of students coming in, whether it's Brian McMahon or others, as one of those areas that is you know, being more resilient to the economic downturn. You take the flip side of it, you look at kind of the rest of Connecticut, netting out Fairfield County and maybe some of the urban areas, you know, we're seeing a much different picture. Mm -hmm. we're seeing, you know, pretty steep enrollment declines, very, very steep growth declines, very little housing driving any of that. Um, so it's almost like the tale of um, two systems, school systems Got across it. the state. Well, I will tell you, if you talk to any ELL teacher or if you go to some of our more urban schools, you go to a PTA meeting, it is the United Nations and from countries you didn't even know there was people were coming to America from. So it is, uh, it is really cosmopolitan. Okay, I don't know if anyone, are there any other questions about PONUS? So that was kind of the focus of our meeting. Um, okay, well, if there are no further comments, the, um, this committee will be meeting again on December 13th, um, and the main topic will be uh, going out through some of the programming of South Norwalk School and where we need the optimal locations. And, um, We'll have a workshop, the full board will have a workshop on December 20th on, on uh, everything, uh, all the facilities we're considering. So what, what we'll do with your blessing is we'll start structuring um, the POTUS discussion that you've had into a set of recommendations from this committee to the full board. And then um, after your meeting on the 13th, uh, relative to uh, South Norwalk, we'll do the same. Uh, so that you, you have a, you know, we'll be able to reflect uh, those recommendations uh, at the at the board workshop and provide, you know, some supporting rationale and data to the full board, similar to you know what you've been considering. Okay. okay. Well, thank you everybody for your participation. <laughs> we do have the minutes. I guess if uh, everyone has a chance to review the minutes. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Bruce. And if so, uh, I have a motion. Oh, second. Okay, second by Val. Um, Brian. Discussion. Uh, Correction. Correction. Okay. Minutes. Yeah, uh, it should be Jalen Saeed instead of John. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Five minutes? Unanimously approved. Thank you. Motion to adjourn.